All righty. Hello and welcome, everybody. Welcome to the stream. I uh, was on my computer doing some work and I was inspired to do this stream today about self custody. What is it? Why is it important? How to do it safely? So we're going to talk about that today. Yesterday, uh, I think this stream today, it was inspired by my stream yesterday that I had with Frank Molina. And uh, we were talking about real DeFi. Um, you know, people, people don't really truly realize what real DeFi is yet. Even institutions, they don't understand what real DeFi is yet. They have somewhat of a prerequisite checklist of what they can invest funds into. For example, corporate finance, which is what Frank works in. And part of that checklist might include something like, oh, there needs to be a board of directors. There needs to be a CEO. But that's actually the opposite of what crypto is all about. And one thing that these institutions need to learn and also people need to learn is the importance of self-custody, which is holding your own keys, holding your own cryptocurrency, because that is what crypto is all about. When you give your money to someone else, that is not self-custody. So when you give your money to someone else, you're trusting them with the money. And that's what a bunch of people did with FTX, and they lost a ton of money. And sadly, it's what a lot of people still do in crypto. They don't fully understand what crypto is all about. Too many people are here for pump and dumps, uh, for get in and get out. Let me just try and make some extra money. They don't understand the, the true vision of what crypto is about. So today, I'm actually going to use some of the material from the course I created that I was trying to do. Uh, me and Randy were doing it together. Um, and I was talking to Frank yesterday and I was just, if you didn't watch the stream with Frank yesterday, it was really awesome. Um, so definitely recommend checking it out. But I was basically telling Frank, and I've had this dilemma for a while, where I made this awesome course, haven't tried doing it as a paid thing, wasn't working super well. I, I don't know. I just want to teach people crypto, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to do that. So here I am. I'm going to just show some of the uh, the course here. Um, and there's a link in the description. I'm eventually going to send it out. If you put your email into the a to z crypto course.com link, I'm going to send out uh, parts of the course. Um, see, I'm just trying to figure it out. I was giving it all away for free before, but yeah, so that is what today's stream is about the importance of self custody. And we're going to start kind of from the basics. First, let me shout out people in the chat. RH Max, good to see you, man. We'll have to link up together soon. Uh, I've missed streaming together. It's been so long. It feels like red squirrel. Good to see you, red squirrel. So yeah, let me just, I'm going to start out with what is cryptocurrency because people, don't really understand it. So crypto, oh, got to share my screen. So we'll start here. Uh, crypto is a new technology. It allows people to send and store money without the need of a bank or institution or a third party, uh, you could also say. So a third party would just be someone else who isn't you. So crypto uses math and code to allow individuals to send or store their own money. And instead of a bank, you can store an infinite amount of money safely with your own cryptocurrency wallet. And we're going to get more into that later. So what's wrong with banks? When you when you give your money to a bank, you're surrendering the legal title of the cash. You're literally legally giving someone else your money and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, now they might, so if they did something illegal, they might go to jail, but that doesn't mean you're going to get your money back, which sucks. So you could get scammed. And you don't get your money back, but the person who scammed you still goes to jail. So then it's like, okay, the person went to jail, but you didn't get your money. Uh, but so this basically means your hard-earned money that you know we slave over, we pay to the government, we pay a bunch of it to the government. It's the banks, and it's not yours. And you're just hoping that they're going to let you buy things when you go to the store and buy things, which is kind of crazy when you really think about that. Uh, so. Banks can literally use that money however they want. They can go trade your money. They can go. They can lend out like ninety percent of your money and not even have your money at their their bank. They they might not even have your money there. They've loaned it out, and it's just crazy. So, so if you want to use your own money that you've so kindly given the bank legally, and you probably a lot of people didn't even realize don't even realize they do this. This can take a long time. Sometimes, I mean, I've had issues sending money with banks where it's really annoying. So for example, when I do my crypto, when I was doing this course paid and when I do like one-on-ones with people, I have a business checking account and then I have a personal checking account. 
Okay. I send money from my business account to my personal account. It literally can take like three days, but the money, the money disappears from my business account. And then it takes three days for it to reappear in my personal account. So there's three days where I just like my money is just gone. And it's like, what the heck? <laughs> like, why does this take so long to just put the numbers from here to here? It, it shouldn't take that long. So uh, banks are closed on the weekend. Like what? Uh, this is like what we the money we slave over the people who control our money. Uh, they, they just close on the weekend. They're like, Oh, sorry. Uh, we're going to good luck. I mean, like what the heck? Uh, and they can prevent you from sending your money, um, for whatever reason. So that's kind of scary. Uh, so why is crypto better? Well, crypto allows people to send money instantly 24, seven, seven days a week. No one can stop you from sending your cryptocurrency. You have complete control of your money. And that is what self custody is. Uh, but there are a lot of dangers to self-custody which we're going to talk about in a little bit uh so yeah so that is stop sharing so that's what crypto is all about but what is crypto in modern day so i'm going to go talk about that real quick and then we'll get into the actual self-custody part but i think this is some nice this is a nice setup for uh what we're going to talk about i'll start from the beginning of this here we go Now sharing screen. So crypto in present day, because we, we just learned what crypto is supposed to be about. Uh, so right now, Bitcoin is over 14 years old. Ethereum's eight years old. There's thousands of cryptos. Bitcoin and Ethereum are like the most popular. There's all these crypto exchanges where people can buy and sell crypto. And crypto is gaining more and more attention from mainstream institutions. Lately in the news has been... Uh, BlackRock wants to get a Bitcoin ETF and BlackRock is a giant, like the biggest bank, one of the biggest banks in the world, pretty much. Um, so yeah, today, a lot of ways, the true meaning of crypto has been lost and these crypto exchanges that I showed you, there's over 500 in the world, crypto exchanges, they work the same way as banks. And in most cases, they're even worse. So crypto is all about you holding your own money. But what we have now in crypto is people are just relying on the crypto exchanges to hold their crypto for them. And they're they're totally missing the point of what crypto is all about. So and like I saying, in most cases, these crypto exchanges are even worse. Uh, so banks are buying into crypto now, but that's kind of the opposite of what crypto is all about. It's crypto is about a world where we don't really need banks. You are your own bank. We don't need banks or institutions or people giving us permission to make financial transactions. Um, now, in some ways, banks do try to protect people. I have a lot of people come to me who've been scammed and they want help. I had a woman whose bank pleaded with her not to send money to these people. I guess they still she still was able to, but they tried. They tried to stop her. Um, <laughs> I guess in that case, they should have actually stopped her. But this woman kept sending money to these scammers. Um, so sadly, you know, it's not perfect. But uh, banks also, I mean, sometimes they just stop people from sending money who didn't do anything wrong. And that's pretty messed up. So, yeah, we have these banks buying into crypto. People are all excited about it. But really, crypto is kind of about the opposite of that. We just want, like, why are we excited about banks coming and having more control over this new currency of crypto or assets of crypto? Uh, when that's kind of what it's not about at all. So when you are leaving your cryptocurrency on a centralized exchange, you're giving them control of your money. They can decide if you can send your crypto. They decide if you can withdraw your crypto. And they have ownership over what you think is your crypto. So <laughs> does this sound familiar? It's just like banks, but it can be worse. So self-custody, which I'm the stream is about, which I will we're going to talk about how to do it um, safely, et cetera, later on. Self-custody is how you can avoid all of this. You can actually own your cryptocurrency and no one can tell you if you can send it or not. No one can tell you if you can uh, withdraw it or not. You have ownership of your crypto. If you have crypto right now that's on Coinbase or Kraken or Gemini or any other exchange where you've created an email and a password, that's not your crypto. You don't actually own that. And who even knows if the crypto is there? And that's exactly what happened with FTX. So, so what's the point? Like, 
why do centralized exchanges want your crypto? Well, they make fees off of their users. So they would want you to keep your crypto with them. And just like banks, they also use your crypto for their own desires. So this was pre-FTX. So funny how history keeps repeating itself. Quadriga CX uh, is a famous exchange. It was the biggest crypto exchange in Canada. Uh, it was it lost everyone's money. And it was found that the CEO was taking all the money people were depositing into his exchange. He was showing them a number on a screen. So they'd log into their accounts. They would see a number that was like, oh, you have $100,000 worth of Bitcoin. And people were like, yeah, I have I have all this money here. But in reality, he was taking that money and he was sending it to different exchanges and then he was trading it and he was really bad and was losing all the money. So, uh, yeah, so honest, hardworking people lost millions of dollars because they trusted a third party. And there's a documentary on Netflix called The Crypto King, and it's pretty good. Um, so you can look that up and watch it. Uh, it's kind of gut riching too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but it's a good, good, uh, documentary to watch so literally crypto exists so you don't have to trust someone else to hold your money and that is what self-custody is all about so celsius and ftx are examples of centralized exchanges screwing over their customers uh, and so these are the people who this guy ran a centralized exchange basically called celsius <laughs> literally wear shirts that say banks are not your friends um, so they look like normal, trustworthy people. They often, a lot of times these guys come off as like nerdy. They don't come off as scammers, basically. They come off as like these like, yeah, you know, I'm here to do good and change the world or whatever. Um, and they ended up stealing all these people's money. And it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Banks are not your friends. Hey, I'm here to tell you, you know, banks aren't your friends. When he literally was running something worse than a bank that lost everyone's money. Uh, this guy right here. So... Just crazy. Um, so this is why it's so important to hold your crypto in your own wallet. So this means you should take your crypto off of a centralized exchange after you purchase it and send it to your own crypto wallet. Uh, now, that being said, centralized exchanges, they kind of are a necessary evil. They make it easy to cash out of crypto. Um, otherwise, you'd have to like find someone to send you dollars to your bank account and then you would send them the crypto to their crypto wallet or something like that. Um, so, you know, they're kind of a necessary evil, but it's kind of like get in and get out. A lot of people call centralized exchanges. They compare them to like a gas station bathroom <laughs> where you just like get in and get out. Um, so, so yeah, so I only use a centralized exchange when I have to bring new money in to invest in crypto cash out my crypto to dollars to put in my bank account. And I, yeah, I never store my crypto on a centralized exchange. And so, yeah, crypto in present day, most of crypto now is just a wild world of gamblers and scam scammers all trying to make as much money as they can. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with trying to make as much money as you can in crypto. I mean, that's why most of, I mean, a lot of us are here. We want to make money. We, we see it as a vehicle to, increase our our money uh but sadly many people have been tricked into thinking that trading is the best way to get rich in crypto when in reality that's how you lose all your crypto uh and you make centralized exchanges rich because as you're trading and hopping in and out of things you're paying these fees that the centralized exchange is making all this money on so it actually benefits a centralized exchange that you don't take your crypto off and put it in your own crypto wallet uh, because then they're going to make less money. So uh, <laughs> it's funny how that works. And so, yeah, the true meaning of crypto has certainly been lost. But uh, yeah, if you can stick to the true principles, you can truly prosper. And that would be self-custody is the big one we're talking about today. Um, so, yeah. Now I'm actually going to get into self-custody. So we just talked about why it's important. And that was the first part of the stream. Now we're going to talk about how to do it. And I have tutorials that go into more detail. I'm just going to be kind of laying the groundwork right now. Um, so yeah, let's get into that. And let me just see the chat here. Come by for open mic on Friday around 4 p.m. Eastern. 
Huh. Maybe I will, RH Max. Would be good to have you back on. Nice. Drix. Hello, Drix. Good to see you, man. Everyone hit the like. If you're new here, hit that subscribe. As you see from my little banner down at the bottom, I'm trying to reach 10,000 subscribers. I think that would be kind of cool to do. Um, so, yeah. Hit subscribe if you'd like. I have some pretty good streams, I think. I've got some good videos, good content out there. So, all right, here we go. So now, let's talk a little bit more about self-custody, how to do self-custody. First, let's kind of understand the blockchain. So crypto is like the Wild West. There's endless danger and endless opportunity. Uh, and crypto is all about eliminating middlemen, like I said in the last section. Therefore, it requires a very high level of self-responsibility. So if you are your own bank, you are responsible for your money. <laughs> so if you mess up with the bank, so this is kind of the thing people like about banks despite all the bad things I said about them and centralized exchanges as well, in some ways, um, if you mess up a transaction or something goes wrong, they're going to help you reverse it. They're going to sort it out for you. You know, if you wire money to the wrong person by accident or something, there's a way to, you know, claw it back and redo it. But in crypto, if I try to send crypto to my friend and I mistype his address, uh, then it's just, and I send it, then it's just gone and no one's there to like save me. Uh, it just, there's no way to get it back. And that's because transactions are irreversible in crypto. And to understand why, it's good to understand what is the blockchain and how does it work. And I'm giving you a very basic understanding. You could really go down the rabbit hole and learn this stuff if you wanted. Um, but a blockchain is just an immutable digital ledger. So immutable is a fancy way of saying it's unchanging over time or unable to be changed. And so once something happens, you can't go back and change it, essentially. And a ledger is just a book or other collection of financial accounts of a particular type. And that is a fancy way of just, I mean, your bank is a ledger, right? Your bank has a ledger of all the transactions that are happening. So the blockchain is an unchangeable ledger, basically. It's like once a transaction has occurred, can't be changed. You can't go back. There's no take backsies. <laughs> There's no, uh, you know, getting the money back. And it's also totally public. So this is kind of cool. Transactions are visible to everyone. Everyone can see what's going on on the blockchain. The banks, we don't know what's going on on those ledgers, really. I mean, we don't know if banks are like sending money around to each other to avoid appearing insolvent. We don't know what's going on. There's all kinds of weird stuff that could be going on. And we just have no idea about our own currency, the dollar. It's funny. So here's a ledger that you would have like in a, in a bank right here. So name of the account, you know, doctor, <laughs> doctor, Ben Dubard, you know, that'd be me. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, when did it happen? So if you go in your bank account and look, you'd see your ledger in your bank account. And then etherscan.io, which we'll go to, this is uh, the ledger of the blockchain. Here, I show this tab. So here it is. And we can see the latest transactions. So we had someone send money from this address to this address. And we can actually go and look at this guy's address. Oh, look, this guy has $10,000 worth of Ethereum. Oh, cool. Interesting. You know, what's he, what's he up to? That kind of thing. Um, and notice, although we can see this person's money, we can see every transaction they've ever done uh, on the blockchain, we don't know their name, you know, we don't know who this guy is, where he lives, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so that is the, the blockchain's ledger. Pretty cool. So like I was saying, okay, you can see this now, a traditional bank stores and records all transactions in a ledger, but this ledger is not on the blockchain. The bank has the power to change or undo any transaction that occurs. And that's really convenient if you're, you know, sending money to the wrong place or whatever. Um, but this ledger is also private. So all kinds of suspicious things could happen without anyone knowing you could be depositing your money and your money is going to fund something that you really don't like, uh, for example, 
And you'd be like, wait, wait a minute. If I knew that, I wouldn't have given this bank my money. I might have given it to a different bank that's using my money maybe for like things I approve of or whatever. So the blockchain is run by computers all over the world. This is very basic, <laughs> what I'm explaining. These computers hold the same copy of the digital ledger and they make sure the transactions are honest. I'm basically, I'm watering all of this down to make it uh, more understandable. Um, so that's why no one can stop you because you have all these computers running at once, allowing things to be sent. Uh, and they're making sure the transactions are honest. Meaning if, if you have in your wall, your self custody account, you know, you have one Bitcoin and you try to send three Bitcoin, the computers that hold that all verify the digital ledger to be, you know, what it is, they'll say, Oh, this guy doesn't have three Bitcoin. He can't do that. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And that can stop people from sending people money. And then that's why things are irreversible. Cause if you, you know, send sent a Bitcoin to someone and then tried to send another one when you sent the one you had and you didn't have any more, that would be a big problem. Uh, you'd have people, you know, scamming basically. So yeah. So here's like how you could visualize blockchain network. All these computers around the world, they all have a copy of the ledger and they're all making sure that every, that people are being honest. And because these computers are making sure people are being honest, they're being paid in the crypto of the blockchain. Um, so, and why does that crypto of the blockchain have value? Well, people are putting their money, people like the idea of being able to send their money whenever they can, whenever they want. They like the idea of being able to hold their own money. So they take their dollars that they can only have in a bank that isn't, you know, they, they don't own that money. They put it into the crypto and uh, that gives the crypto value. And then you have a bunch of people who are like, oh, this crypto thing, it's going up in value. I'm going to buy and try to sell it higher back in a dollar. So it just results in the price going up or down if people are selling it. So since the blockchain is immutable, it cannot be changed, right? Uh, so this is why when you send a transaction, it can't be undone or erased. And the blockchain is also public. So all transactions are transparent and verifiable forever. You can see what an, if you did manage to link an address like we saw on a, on Etherscan just now on the, on the blockchain ledger for Ethereum, if you did manage to figure out what person owned that account, you could see what they've sent their money to forever. And then you'd need to know, you know, okay, he sent it to this account, but then it's also just random numbers. You need to know who owned that account. But um, yeah, it's there forever. So it's pretty cool. Transparent, verifiable. So different blockchains have their own coin. Bitcoin is its own blockchain. So is Ethereum. And so they have, you know, Bitcoin has the Bitcoin <laughs> BTC and then Ethereum has Ether, but everyone just calls it Ether Ethereum. And like I was kind of saying, the coin uh, is an incentive to those helping the network run, help the network run honestly as it should and get rewarded with Bitcoin or Ethereum. So if you're if you're uh, running your computer or the blockchain and you try to do things dishonestly, you can actually get penalized or you're not going to earn money and then you've just wasted electricity. So there's really no point in doing it. So you're actually so you're incentivized to make sure everything's running honestly. It's pretty cool. So. Yeah, so when a crypto is built on a blockchain in a form of a smart contract, some people call it a token. This is kind of not important in terms of self-custody. So we will get on to that. The Schwans of House Stoner has entered the chat. Good to see you. If you're liking this education, give a like, give a subscribe. Maybe consider sending this to onboards people who don't understand crypto that well and maybe it'll help them that would be cool and if you are new and you're watching this welcome thank you for being here and leave any comments below um let me know what you think so yeah cool all right let's move on let me find where i want to go next Oh, here we go. I was right there, pretty much. So the main takeaway of blockchains, transactions are irreversible. They're immutable. Transactions are public and visible forever. And so if you accidentally send coins to the wrong address or someone gains access to your wallet, so you could have self-custody, like we're talking about in the stream, 
But if someone gets custody of your wallet and then takes your crypto and sends it to their own wallet, there's no way for you to get them back unless you like knew who did it and you went and like tracked them down and then sent them back to a different wallet. Um, but in general, you know, most people I think get hacked online in crypto. You have no idea who just stole your crypto. You can't really go find them in person. It's going to be hard to hack them back. Uh, there's really no way to get them back. So even a single typo in a wallet address can result in losing all the crypto being sent in that transaction. So it's a very fine margin of losing <laughs> a lot of money in crypto. And that's uh, kind of the, the big danger of self-custody. So this is just something I have if you want to think about this. Critical thinking, how could blockchain change the world for better or for worse? Do you think blockchain and crypto could lead to a fair monetary system? So this is a fun way that there's no right or wrong answer to these questions. This is just a way for you to kind of think, think about this stuff, you know? And then I have this here, write down your thoughts. I don't care. You don't have to, I don't care. Do whatever you want. So wallets, seed phrases, and private keys. So the next step to better secure your crypto is to understand wallet seed phrases and private keys. So this is how you can actually self custody. We're going to explain what these things are. So when you transfer your money off of a centralized exchange, which I've been telling you about this whole stream, how awesome, how you need to do that. When you do that, you're completely responsible for the safety of your crypto. That's why it's called self custody. It's all on you. No one's going to save you. Now, what is your cryptocurrency wallet? So <laughs> your cryptocurrency wallet is just a combination of your seed phrase and private keys, which then give you access to all of your funds. And your seed phrase is a usually 12 to 24 word uh, phrase. And this is what allows you to recover all of your crypto. So it's just 12 to 24 words. It's called a phrase. It's not like it's a sentence saying something, but it's 12 to 24 words. If you, you know, most people probably know, it, know what it is. Um, but this is what allows you to recover all of your crypto. And then your private key is what you use to approve spending or transferring your funds. But if someone gets your seed phrase, they then have access to your private key and then they can send your crypto to wherever they want, when usually that would be their own wallet. And so one seed phrase can hold access to multiple private keys slash wallets. So a wallet isn't actually like a wallet with your crypto. Your crypto is, is on the blockchain. All the computers are keeping it honest there. And then you just have the access to get to your crypto that's actually just sitting on the blockchain. So it's just numbers and code. There's no like wallet. That's just a term that's kind of used to help the adoption of crypto, to help people understand, you know, oh, it's in your wallet. Oh, okay. So they think of it like, oh yeah, it's, it's in, like, you know, you have your physical wallet. Oh yeah, it's there. It's mine. But in reality, it's, it's whoever holds the access to it. So, you know, you could... If someone got your seed phrase, they could just, that money is now technically shared by you and that person. And then they could just send it to another wallet that only they have the seed phrase to. Um, <laughs> so like, you know, people seem to think when they, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so we'll keep going. Um, so one thing, you know, sim simplify it. You could think of your seed phrase. It's like a vault access code. So imagine, imagine you have like a vault and inside you have all these different, uh, you know, you got a wall, you got like a pot of gold here, you got a pot of gold here, and they're all different pots of gold for different things. Your vault access code, your C phrase allows you to step into the vault and access your different pots. And then your private key, you could think of as your physical signature that is needed to sign and approve transactions. But you could think of each private key goes to a different pot of gold that you have in your vault. Um, so but yeah, it's you can think of a private key. It's like your physical signature. You know, if you're in the, you're at the bank vault and you want to send your 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 gold somewhere, they're going to be like, okay, are you who you say you are? Give us your signature. You know, they'd probably ask for ID, but you you get what I mean. Um, so yeah, and that's why if you use a hardware wallet or something, which we'll talk about what that is, you'll actually say it'll say like approve signature if you're going to send crypto, and you'll say yes, I approve the signature. So we have these words like signature and wallet that kind of help try to make it easier for people to understand um, crypto. So yeah, danger, never store receipt phrase digitally. Just have that there. We'll talk about that. So 
if someone gains access to your seed phrase, they can steal all your crypto. Like I've, I've said this a million times, but I'm saying it repeatedly. You won't be able to do anything about it. And people have lost fortunes to hackers gaining access to their crypto wallet by acquiring their seed phrase. And authorities can really never do anything to get the money back. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stories of, oh, a guy had, uh, you know, a thousand Bitcoin and he lost his seed phrase and he thinks it's in the dump and like it's worth $300 million. And he's like, oh, crap, I had all that Bitcoin. The thing is that Bitcoin is on the blockchain. It's just no one has the the access to to get it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, like I, I kind of said this earlier. You know, we saw the Ether scam. We saw the Ethereum, the public ledger. You can see if you get scammed and someone takes your money, you'll be able to see. Oh, look! It got sent to this address, and you'll be able to see your money, <laughs> which sucks. But you can't. There's nothing you can do about it. You, you know, you have no way to know who owns the address. Now, what what happens is these hackers, sometimes they send the crypto to a centralized exchange because they want to turn your crypto into actual dollars that they can spend somewhere. But even that, the only time centralized exchanges will really step in is if it's like a really well-known uh, exploit that occurred, like a hacker you know, publicly stole billions of dollars from a protocol or something, and then the exchange will freeze it. Because you could imagine, okay, let's say someone scammed me and I see they sent the money to a centralized exchange like Binance. Well, to sign up for Binance, they had to use their name and address. So, you know, Binance would know their identity. But how am I going to prove to Binance that this person stole the money from me when all they can, all I have is, oh, look, the money was sent from here to here and now to Binance. For all they know, that first wallet was the hacker's wallet. Like I can't, it's hard to, and even if, you know, it's they have more stuff going on than to investigate every it'd be too too much to investigate all these little uh things so what it boils down to is uh you know <laughs> keep your seed phrase safe and avoid letting someone access your crypto um and yeah you aren't required to verify your identity when you create a real crypto wallet but like i said if you send that crypto to a centralized exchange they have your identity but then it becomes okay. How do you? How are you going to get their attention to show? Hey, I was hacked. That's my money. Please freeze it. Um, and it's just very unlikely. So, yeah, you lots of self responsibility. It's up to you to make sure your seed phrase is not lost or compromised by hackers. It's that's pretty much it. It's all on you. And a lot of people don't like that, and that's why they give. They either don't understand this, or they don't like that idea. They say, "Oh, I'd rather trust someone else to hold it." Well, then. <laughs> they lose all the money. You don't get the money back. Maybe the person who lost your money goes to jail or whatever, but you don't get the money back. And then it's just like, well, <laughs> you know, that sucks. Maybe you should have just tried holding it yourself. And so, you know, we're talking about wallets and like I explained, a wallet isn't really like, it's not like a wallet. Your crypto is just on the blockchain. Some, some wallets, as we'll say, I'll just keep saying it, are more secure than others. So a hosted wallet, and this would be, this would just be the term for a wallet that's like on Binance or Coinbase on a centralized exchange. So it's not a real crypto wallet. It's when your money's stored on a centralized exchange or third party application website and you don't have a seed phrase. So if you think you have a wallet right now and you didn't get a 12 to 24 word, you know, sequence, sequence or phrase, you don't actually have crypto. That's not your crypto. You don't own it. Uh, for all you know, it doesn't exist. Like, you're just seeing numbers on a screen. So that's what I'd, you know, this is just the internet. Oh, it's called a hosted wallet, but it's not a real crypto wallet. So this is, you know, you're, you're at the danger of a third party with this kind of wallet. Uh, online wallets. This is a wallet that would store your seed phrase and private key on your device online, AKA digitally. So this would be like MetaMask and Coinbase wallet. So Coinbase they have the Coinbase centralized exchange, but they also have a wallet where they give you a seed freight, where you get a seed phrase from them. Uh, the thing is, these kinds of wallets, your seed phrase, remember I had that big warning a few minutes ago and it said, never store your seed phrase digitally. These online wallets, they actually store your seed phrase for you digitally within the, the browser, within the wallet. 
And it's they do that. So if you forget, you know, what the seed phrase is, you can like go look at it and it's meant to be like, oh, this will help you not lose your crypto. The bad thing is a hacker or a bad person can can also, if they are able to crack your password to your wallet, a password you make to access your wallet, then they can then see your seed phrase and steal your money. So <laughs> Uh, these are, I, I don't feel comfortable using an online. A lot of people use these and it's fine. Like they use these without a hardware wallet, which we're about to talk about. They use these and they're fine. Um, but they are a lot more dangerous and I wouldn't use one of these wallets unless you have a hardware wallet connected to it. So this is a hardware wallet keeps your seed phrase offline with your private keys securely on a USB drive. Um, John Kim, I see your chats and we're going to get to that. And that's a really good point you make here in the chat. Um, so wallets, so trezor.io and ledger.com are their industry standard. I prefer trezor, but ledger is another popular one. And I have ledgers. I just, from now on, I've only been buying trezors. I just think they're easier. Um, and there's other stuff that, you know, we won't get into. So then you have, uh, a hot wallet and a hot wallet could be, a hosted wallet, an online wallet, or a hardware wallet. Um, these could all be examples of hot wallets, and that's just a wallet that's actively used to interact in the crypto space. And it's less secure because you're at the risk of uh, potentially, you know, clicking something malicious, accidentally sending money wrong. And a cold wallet is a wallet that you hold crypto in but never connect online. So this could be like uh, a hardware wallet would be the best example where you don't... Like, for example, you can have a hardware wallet and still be interacting with DeFi and doing things with it and using the money. And you're protected by the hardware wallet, but you're still facing a lot of risk of accidentally messing up and sending the money to someone or giving or allowing someone to access the money. Um, and you're still secure, pretty secure because it's a hardware wallet. But a cold wallet would be something that you don't ever, you just send money to and let it sit there and you never really use it. You, you're, so you're never at risk of accidentally connecting the cold wallet to something bad on the internet that then takes the money or, or whatever. And then there's something called multi-signature wallets. And this would be a wallet that has multiple private keys so that it has multiple signatures needed to send a transaction. So you could have someone, you know, in Canada has the private key and then someone in Australia has the private key. And if someone managed to get to the person in Canada and get access to the wallet, they're not able to send the, they're not able to steal the crypto because that person in Australia has to also approve the transaction. So this is like extra security. And you could think of it like a bank vault that needs two or more keys to open the vault at any time. So, you know, a bank robber goes to a bank and he's like, open the safe. And the teller's like, I can't, my manager's not here. He has, you know, the second key and we need both of them. Then the robber's like, ah, oh. so it's just, it's a similar thing to that. Um, and this could be a hot or cold wallet depending on the use, you know, like I just explained a hot or cold wallet depends on how you're using it. And like I, I kind of got ahead of myself earlier, the term wallets just used to help people better understand crypto. Uh, in reality, you do not have a wallet. You have a seed phrase that allows you access to your crypto that is stored within the blockchain. So if someone gets your seed phrase, they effectively own your wallet with you. You like share your crypto with that person now. And they could then take those funds and send them to a wallet that they only have the seed phrase for. So then they now have full control, full access, I should say, to your funds. Um, and then you're like, oh, crap. So securing your crypto. Uh, so I say, you know, the best way is to uh, use a hardware wallet. And I have a Trezor right here, you can see. Um, and if you get a hardware wallet, buy them directly from the website, which are listed here, um, Trezor.io. And I have a link, I think I have a link in the description of this video uh, for Trezor. Um, and the reason you wanna get it directly from the manufacturer is <laughs> hackers and scammers are very clever. And they sell fake hardware wallets that are not secure on third-party websites, including Amazon. I know we all love Amazon because it's convenient and fast, uh, but don't buy, a, take the crypto stuff very seriously. Don't buy a Trezor uh, from Amazon. Um, 
So when you set up your hardware wallet, you'll get your seed phrase. And I have a, I have tutorials on how to do it on this YouTube channel. What? And then you can write down your seed phrase on a piece of paper. And we're going to talk about more advanced methods in a second. So don't freak out, everyone. And remember, don't store this seed phrase digitally. Uh, so no photos, text files, et cetera, of your private key anywhere. This includes like a password manager. Don't put your seed phrase in a password manager. You, you don't want it anywhere digital because there that is how a hacker could, because all because if a hacker gets that seed phrase, they can just take all your money because your money is stored digitally. So you want to keep the access to your money, not digital. So there's no way anyone could be hunting for it without you knowing. Because if you have something stored digitally, a hacker could be going on like a scavenger hunt for your thing and you wouldn't even know it. So if you had your seed phrase, not digital, but like buried in your backyard, you probably notice, oh, look, this guy's like creeping around in my backyard. Is he looking for my it's a weird example? But you get what I mean. Um, and so then, you know, easiest way is just to write your seed phrase on paper, especially if you're brand new. But as you could imagine, if you lose that seed phrase, not necessarily if it gets stolen, but if you just lost it, you, you might not have access to your money. Uh, if you, you know, your seed, you know, there's ways that you could lose it and you could still get there and send it to a new wallet. But uh, you don't want to lose your seed phrase either. Um, so you could carve it into metal plates or um, something like that to prevent fire or water damage. Because that would suck. You have your seed phrase and you like spill coffee on it or something. Um, but yeah, you could be the biggest danger to yourself. You know, getting hacked, getting robbed, it's a possibility. But I think uh, the hidden danger a lot of times is you messing up. So I, I had a guy who told me how he had written his seed phrase down with pen on paper and then he left it in the sun and he came back and it was like super faded and he almost lost a seed phrase. <laughs> That's crazy, you know, you wouldn't even think of that. But so, yeah. So if you're someone who's watching this, you're already using MetaMask without a hardware wallet. Like I said, MetaMask is an online wallet. It stores your seed phrase in the browser. Uh, your seed phrase is stored digitally. And then I have a video, you'll see it on my channel. I don't have to click this, but it's called, if you use MetaMask, watch this video. So yeah, using a, a wallet like MetaMask, an online wallet without a hardware wallet is very um, dangerous uh, because a hacker would be able to break into the file and steal your seed phrase. And I have a whole video, how to connect a hardware wallet to MetaMask tutorial. Best option is to get a hardware wallet, move your funds into it. And then that's protected by a new seed phrase that has never been stored digitally. Um, so there you go. So this is what John Kim in the chat is talking about. A 25th word. So for extra security, you can add a 25th word to your 24 word seed phrase. Sometimes it might be 12 words. Um, and there really isn't a huge security difference between 12 and 24. But the cool thing about a 25th word is you can make it custom like you can make this word whatever you want. So there's actually a list of, you know, words that could potentially be in a seed phrase. Um, the 25th word is something from your brain that could be completely random. It can be as long and complex as you want. I have a video on how to do that as well on the channel. Um, and you could keep the 25th word away from the 24 word phrase. Uh, so even if someone stole your seed phrase, they wouldn't be able to access your money because you added a 25th word. Um, so that's pretty cool. And what John is saying here is, and it's called a passphrase. It's a 25th word, but it's called a passphrase by Trezor. But it essentially, it needs to be treated as a as a seed phrase word, as a 25th word, because like John is saying, uh, if you don't remember your passphrase and you send money to your wallet, you need your passphrase to access your funds. It's just like having a seed phrase. Like you need, it's part of your seed phrase now. You can't change your passphrase. And that's, it's a confusing that it's called a passphrase because people associate it with, oh, it's a passphrase. I can, you know, change it. You can't change it. Once you, once you set the passphrase and you send crypto to it, uh, you need that passphrase from now on to access your funds. And so John, and I actually encountered someone uh, doing a one-on-one -on -one about this very thing. If you use a passphrase, do yourself a favor and make it easy because if you don't remember it and you send money to that wallet, you lose your money. I hope you didn't learn that from experience, John. Uh, but yeah, I had someone once, we were doing a one-on-one. -on -one. Luckily, she hadn't sent money to her wallet yet, but she was like, 
she's like, oh, I set up my wallet. I made a passphrase and now I want to send money to it with your help. And I said, okay, cool. Then she couldn't, she's like, oh man, my passphrase is so long and complex. I can't, like, I keep entering it wrong. And I was like, well, that's not good. Uh, like, <laughs> so it, there's a security is like a, a real, there's a real balance in self custody with crypto where like, you don't want to make it too hard that you like scam yourself basically and lose your money. Like I said, you could be your biggest threat to yourself. So hence having a passphrase adds a level of security, but it could also <laughs> keep you out too. Uh, Drick says 100. That's right. Thank you, Drix. No, I didn't lose my money, but I made it complicated that I mistyped it thinking I lost my funds. So that that's another thing. If you enter your passphrase wrong, it you're still accessing a wallet. It's just not the wallet that has your money. And this is, if you're brand new to this stuff, this is probably all very confusing. And it, it would make a lot more sense if you actually set up your, your hardware wallet and did these things, then it would make sense. So a lot of people who've done this probably know what I'm talking about. So for example, I had a guy who he wrote down, okay, I'm going to make my passphrase this. And he wrote it down. And then when he actually entered it into the Trezor to make it his passphrase, he put a typo. And he accessed the wallet and it said, okay, here's your wallet. And he thought his passphrase was what he typed, what he wrote down. And he thought he typed what he wrote down, but he had a typo and he didn't realize it. Then he sent money to the wallet. Then he came back and typed in what he thought was his passphrase that he wrote on a piece of paper and he couldn't get his money. And he was like, you know, he's freaking out and I'm freaking out. And I was like, I'm not, I wasn't freaking out, but internally I was like, okay, this is pretty messed up. Uh, cause I was like, he paid me to help him set this stuff up. So I'm like, okay, I feel responsible. This is messed up. And I said, the, the only thing I could think is that you did a typo. Cause I'm looking on, I'm like trying to find a solution. I'm like, okay, maybe something's wrong. It's just pulling up the wrong account. I was like, okay, the only thing I can think what happened is that you did a typo when you typed it in, uh, you know? And so I told him just type in your passphrase and type a typo you think you would make. And he did that. And his second attempt, the money, like he, he got into his actual wallet that he'd sent money to. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty crazy. And, you know, I figured, okay, we know he, he, what he typed in, he probably made a typo. I figured there was some way where we could troubleshoot to eventually find the right thing but I was kind of worried it might take a long time, but it only took two tries and it worked out. So be very, very careful. Um, so yeah, if you mistype your your phrase, you create a new wallet. Um, if you're on Trezor Suite and it tells you that the wallet is empty, but you know for a fact that you sent money, it's a red flag and stop what you're doing. Yep. Timothy Harris, nice hoodie, Ben. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, this is USA. Uh, this is like the USA Stalker logo. So it's, I think Tim would know that. So it's pretty cool. I was actually refing a tournament and I saw this for sale for 20 bucks. I was like 20 bucks for a hoodie. That's pretty sweet, you know, and it's a nice hoodie. So, but yeah, moving on. So, all right, you get your seed phrase. Now, where do you put it? Uh, you never put it anywhere digitally, no matter how secure you think you are. Now, you know, there's probably people out there who are smarter than me and they have this whole system in place and it works for them and okay, whatever. But it really, it's you shouldn't do it. And the smart and, you know, I've had people, they're like, oh, well, I store digitally and I know what I'm doing and I have all this stuff. No one will ever find it. And I'm not going to sit there and argue with them. But I will say that the most intelligent crypto security people I know and I've learned from, no, they say never store digitally. And these guys know a lot more than me and a lot more than most people. So uh, I wouldn't do it. Even if you're like, oh, I've got it split up in 10 different documents and it's hidden and blah, blah, blah. it's still like a, it's still there. Like someone could still piece it together. Um, so outside of this major rule, it can depend on the individual. There's no real, it's hard to say what's the best way. I mean, you could, you know, most common way people write it on paper and really when you take a step past that, you carve it in metal plates or metal washers. So they have these really expensive metal carve into metal things on Trezor and Ledger's websites, but they, they're really expensive, you know? And it's like, 
if you have a lot of seed, like maybe you have multiple seed for it, like one of them costs like 200 or 300 bucks. One of these metal things, you might have multiple seed phrases and then it's kind of like, okay, I don't want to pay so much money. So Carl says, could use thumb drives, but those die all the time. Yeah, that's a big one too. People, you know, someone asked uh, me before, you know, if I have a, a, an encrypted thumb drive, that's max security the seed phrase would be safe and it's like yeah it would be safe but it could die like the the thumb drive could could die and you could lose access so storing it physically is the way to go um so yeah this is the method of carving a seed phrase into metal washers and this is like kind of a cost efficient way you could just go to like a hardware store and get this stuff and then there's actual um there's things you can buy to like staple these in. There's crypto websites. Uh, so the tutorial is by Crypto Kindness. This tutorial is awesome. Uh, it's it's really, really, really good. And then he's got the things you need to buy it here. Um, you know, I kind of want to make my own just because I think it'd be cool. Um, not that his, his tutorial is amazing. It's a great tutorial. Um, but I think it'd be good to have just because I'm like telling people about it. And then uh yeah so once you've written your once you've you know got it in a way that suits you your seed phrase you can strategize where to store it and this is where it gets very personal um you know i don't know i don't know what your living situation is you know if you live in a room with five people your storage method is going to be different than if you live like alone on a farm or something so you know and so security is a spectrum Someone, like I said, someone living alone on a farm may store their seed phrase differently than someone living in a crowded apartment. And this is kind of like common sense, but it's also like, I know this, I say it's common sense, but crypto is also very daunting. And, and so if you're brand new, this is very kind of like scary, I think. And, you know, uh, it's very scary to be like, oh crap, like I could lose all my money. How do I store it? And like uh, John Kim was saying earlier in the chat, you know, if you make things too complicated, you could finesse yourself like, oh, I'm going to make a treasure map and bury my seed phrase and I'm going to carve it into metal and then bury it. And I'm going to have a secret map to get there. And then your map gets water damage or catches on fire or something, or you don't make the map good enough. And then your seed phrase is buried in your yard and you're like, oh, crap. So like, <laughs> you know, you really have to just use your own common sense. Okay. Where's somewhere I can store it. That's going to be okay. And like, it'll be good. So, so yeah. And then this is the critical thinking activity for this part. What are some creative and secure ways you could think of storing your seed phrase? How much is too much? What point do you think storing your seed phrase for security may cause you to lose it? So, you know, you always got to just measure these things out for yourself. Some people are comfortable with uh, more than other people, you know, and I, I think the, the odds of you physically getting robbed for your seed phrase are pretty low, you know, uh, I don't know. So Drick says you could go to the farm and meticulously train a guard chicken. See that, that is a creative method. <laughs> and so then some other things you could do, you know, this is all about self custody. That's what we're talking about here. Seed phrase, everything. Um, there's some things that aren't necessary, but I highly recommend. And I say, have a password manager and this is not so you can store your seed phrase in it, but it's just, if you're in crypto and if you're just on the internet, you have a lot of different passwords and they need to be secure. Um, and they need to be different. You don't want to use the same password for every website. Uh, so an offline password manager. So if you use an online password manager, it could get hacked and you know, people like the, the company that's hosting it could get hacked and your passwords could get leaked. But if you use an offline one, um, you know, then you set your own password and then it's stored, you know, encrypted on your device with your password. And it's a little safer. It is a little more inconvenient because an online password manager, no matter what device you use, it's got your passwords there. The offline one, you need to, you know, add these, you know, it's a file that needs to be transferred. So it can be kind of annoying in that sense, but um, it's the, it's a safe way. And it, it does feel good having, you know, diverse complex passwords. Um, and this password manager, it'll make the password for you. Like it'll generate it for you. 
Uh, so you don't have to sit there and type a bunch and think. Um, and then you can just copy paste it whenever you sign in. So yeah, you can copy paste your password, but this does not include your seed phrase. Don't put your seed phrase in one of these. Uh, VPN, um, this can like hide your, this can kind of like keep your location private. Um, but honestly, you know, <laughs> I haven't changed this since I've talked to RH Max a ton. RH Max is big, uh, another YouTuber big against VPNs. So it's not super important. Malware protection, again, not super important because your computer has built in malware protection. Really, you just need, instead of malware protection, you could just have a laptop that you only use for crypto because, uh, you know, you're you're not going to use your crypto laptop for like weird browsing activity, you know? Like if I'm on my normal computer, a friend might send me a link and he thought it was legit and it wasn't, or I might just be clicking around and not really paying attention and I click something and I'm like, oh, this is bad, you know? Um, but on a crypto laptop, you know, if you're doing crypto and you're on your crypto laptop, hopefully you're very keyed in and you're aware of what you're doing and you're you're very cautious before clicking things and you're not using it all the time. So there's less chance of you making a mistake. So a Mac is what uh, is recommended by people. HP is another one um, really like Mac though, uh, as RH Max likes to always say, um, like 80% of the attack surface is targeted at Windows users. So if you're using a Mac, there's a lot less like likely of a chance you're going to run into malware on the internet. So it's like using a Mac is like driving through the nice neighborhood. <laughs> and then using Windows is like driving through the bad neighborhood, according to RH Max. And th that's a good analogy, I think. Um, you know, you could be in the bad neighborhood with your doors locked, but someone could bust the window or whatever. Um, did you buy a very cheap Mac just for crypto? Also, can you interact on dApps only with this laptop? I have a HP. I know Papa Boner is big on HPs. I know BK DOS bomb. He has a whole video on crypto laptops. You could just, I mean, it's really, could you only interact with dApps and internet browsing? And I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, I go on, on my crypto laptop, I've gone on deck screener before, you know, Oh, or, or whatever. So, you know, it's a spectrum. Like I said, um, and I go on the internet and I search for like the dApps I want to use. But yeah, you you really, as long as you have a hardware wallet, that's a big thing too. Use the hardware wallet because even like a big risk, you obviously you don't want to click a malicious malware link. A big risk is when you aren't using a hardware wallet, you click a link that then allows someone to access your MetaMask. But if you're using a hardware wallet, even they can't access your funds because you they would need to have the physical device to like approve it, you know? Like I held up earlier. I don't know where I put it. Where did it go? My, oh no, I lost it. Oh, wait, here it is. <laughs> you know, it's like a two FA. They would need to approve it. So, but still, um. So yeah, that is um. That's pretty much it for the stream. Oh wow, it's like an hour exactly, almost. That's cool because I was thinking I'd do an hour. So I'm probably gonna. So do you do all of your hexics through your hardware wallet and et cetera? Yes. <laughs> if your hexics aren't on a hardware wallet, that's a that's a big um I would I and I have a video. Let me share screen with you guys for my video. My mo my most popular video is how to um actually secure your hex stakes. Here, share my screen. So this video right here. And it's it's pretty confusing. I just put the link in the chat. It's pretty confusing, but you know you can watch the video. You can do it on your own. Um, but if not, I have a Patreon, and you can. Yeah. So the the general, this is how you get one on ones with me, um, and I help people one on one. Uh. This is the link in the chat. If you put in your email, I'll get this material that I just showed to you. I'll email it to you at some point. Maybe not uh, immediately, but I need to edit it a little bit. Um, 
I did my hex stakes before I got my hardware wallet, so I have to wait, I guess. Well, what you would want to do is transfer that seed phrase to a hardware wallet. Um, so you can, sadly, you can't transfer those stakes to a new seed phrase, but you can transfer that seed phrase to a hardware wallet, John. Um, so... So yeah, if you liked the stream, consider joining the Patreon. Uh, I work one-on-one. -on -one. I've got regular people I see. I help them set up their hardware wallets. I have videos on how to do it, but some people, it's it's uh, they want the one-on-one -on -one help. So if you are one of those people, I know it looks expensive, but you get half off if you do it through the Patreon. There's nine spots remaining. Um, this is probably going to go down soon because I have people who are on like a package deal that I did outside of this. Um, and once those package deals are up, I'm just going to have them do this. Um, and I know it's, it might seem expensive, but the deal is, uh, I help people secure like a lot of money and I'm taking the risk of them losing that money. And I'm not really getting the, the upside of if that money does well financially, like I don't get a percentage of what you make in crypto. Um, so it's so yeah, I've raised it to five hundred, but um, through the Patreon, it's two fifty, and that's limited availability. Um, shit, that's cheap. And here's the thing: if it's too much for you, you can literally watch my videos, and you can you could join for five a month, and then join the group chat, and then I can help you like as much as I, I possibly can. You can do it on your own. It's just some people they want the luxury of having the one on one. Um, and yeah, so that's the stream. Um, thank you for watching. Share this with people. Uh, this is, I think this would be a really good video. If, you know, a lot of this stuff people probably already know. Davis makes a great point. Imagine all the people lose, all the money people lose. They wish they just paid 250 to five. Exactly. Like, that's what I'm saying. You know, um, I don't like people paying me that money if like, it's a lot for them and they're like struggling to pay it. But that's the thing is like, I want to help people, but it's, it's, it's hard for it's tedious work. I'm taking on a lot of risk, um, but I do want to help people. And I think it's a needed kind of service and I've had lots of great reviews from it. So, uh, you know, I was trying to do the course, but I think the course I'm going to, what I just showed you guys is from my course, I'm going to start kind of using the course to, hopefully get people to then do one-on-ones um, and the course will just kind of be like a free thing for people to learn. Um, so if you know someone who would benefit from the stream, share with them. If you benefited from the stream, comment and let me know. Really appreciate it. Shout out to people watching the replay. Shout out to all the people who are here live. Appreciate you guys. And uh, yeah, I'll probably stream sometime soon. Um, but yeah, I'm going to play the outro and then I will be out. Peace out, everyone. Thank you for being here.